I remember there was somebody in my life who told me when around that time, he was like, whatever your dreams are, make them bigger because they're, they're too small. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is such a treat. I had so much fun in this conversation and I know you're going to love it. We'll be covering topics like creativity, healing, and finding inner peace. I'm so excited for you to meet today's guest, Diego Perez, also known as Young Pueblo. Diego Perez is a meditator and number one New York Times bestselling author who is widely known on social media through his pen name, Young Pueblo. Online, he has an audience of over 3 million people. He has sold over 1 million books worldwide that have been translated into over 25 languages. His writing focuses on the power of self-healing, creating healthy relationships, and the wisdom that comes when we truly work on knowing ourselves. Diego's fourth book, The Way Forward, just released this past October. Hello, Diego. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to get into this. And I'm such a fan. I love your work. So authentic. And I think that's why a lot of people resonate with it because it's like, literally, we can feel it from the heart. Let's talk about your backstory. I'm curious, who was Diego Perez before Young Pueblo? Diego Perez before Young Pueblo. That was... um. You know, that was a period of my life where I was just trying to get my act together. So to really tell a story of what happened before Young Pueblo, I have to kind of go back to um, when I was uh, born. I was born in Guayaquil, Ecuador, so in South America. And uh, my parents, they moved us uh, to the United States. Um, my mom, my dad, and my brother and I, we came here when I was about four years old. And we moved to Boston. And... It was a really challenging situation there because we, not only were we in a brand new place that was really far away from the rest of our family, but we were growing up in really serious poverty and we were just like stuck in this classic American poverty trap where we just didn't, um, you know, like my mother and father, they, they were constantly struggling to pay the rent. They were constantly struggling to put food in the fridge and it was a battle for them. Like it was really difficult. And I think during that time as a child, like seeing them struggle, seeing them fight, it imprinted a lot of sadness and anxiety inside of me that I didn't know how to process. So a lot of my time before I was Young Pueblo, or sorry, before I took the pen name Young Pueblo, it was just trying to figure out how to process the sadness and anxiety that was happening inside of me because it actually ended up leading me down this pretty dark path where I ended up you know, abusing drugs and alcohol and really just pushing my body and my life to the edge. Yeah. And what do you think was the turning point or what looked like the turning point? And when did you begin writing? The turning point was really when my body couldn't handle it anymore. So I had this moment where I almost lost my life from just, you, you know, just partying way too much, doing way too many drugs one e evening. And um, that was the summer of 2011. Luckily, I'm still here. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. But that night, I realized that I needed to make some big changes. And one of those changes was simply to just start telling myself the truth. And I, you know, threw away the hard drugs. I started telling myself the truth. I started taking care of my body more. And fast forward a year from that time, I did my first silent 10 day meditation retreat. And even from that first one, I started feeling like there was creativity opening up in my mind, but it was after my third silent 10-day retreat. And this was, I think, in 2013 when I really got that, you know, big sort of like intuitive call to start writing. Wow. But then even then, it scared me to start writing. So I didn't really start taking writing seriously until like the end of 2014. Wow. Okay. So that must've been a transformative time, 2011 to 2014. Even like jumping yeah. into a 10 day silent retreat after living that lifestyle is such a, like, is literally taking a 180. It's so different. Yeah. It's like, so how did you even yeah. find out about that world? And did, did someone introduce you to it? Did you just like search it up online? I actually found it through my, one of my best friends. So my friend Sam, he um, he ended up doing one six months before me, and when he told me about it, you know, I was just really shocked that 
he got so much from it. And, it, and to me, hearing his experience sounded, it sounded like really deeply transformative. And I felt like I was in a really transitional state where I was looking for just like a new life path and a new sort of, you know, way to cultivate myself. And I ended up doing it about six months after him and he, and it just like was so mind opening. I remember after that first course, I felt like I had learned more in 10 days than in four years of college. Cause you know, this was a time like I had just graduated from college. Wow. That's amazing. Are you still friends with Sam now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're very close friends. That's so nice. So you started writing and then when did you start posting it under this pen name, Young Pueblo? Oh, so... Was it immediate? Like once you decided to start writing, you like opened an account? So once I decided to start writing, what I actually ended up doing first was I went back and I started reading all of my favorite books again, but with a different mindset. I wanted to read not just for pleasure, but for structure. Like I wanted to try to understand like, you know, what are my favorite authors doing? Like, how are they using their commas? How are they using their semicolons? Like, you know, and just trying to really take it in. And then I started writing and I think it was like around 2014, 2015 that I opened, you know, I started, I turned my account from a personal account to like a public account. And, um, and then I started sharing, but in the beginning, this was before, you know, Instagram had videos. This was before like all that. So I would just share pictures of nature that I would take. And, um, and then I would share like little essays underneath in the caption. And in that time, like, you know, my uh, the audience grew to maybe like around 30,000 people and it was very very slow growth but then when i started taking the main ideas of my essays and i started sharing poetry and putting it in white images you know black and white images that's when everything started taking mm, off i see i kind of love that you started with the beginning of instagram like in that era no one really knew how to use it like anything goes it was it's mm -hmm. nice to hear that story because I, I, I'm in the same generation where like we started using social media at the very beginning. Okay, yeah. But in terms of your writing, you said they were essays. So, you're, so they were longer. And then were they always about like healing and your personal life? Yeah, I actually, I didn't really share about my personal life. I more so shared about what I was reflecting on. So, you know, there were time periods when I was reflecting a lot about letting go. I, I was reflecting a lot on self-love. I was reflecting on, you know, our experience of like, you know, how you go from being one version of yourself into a better version of yourself. So all these parts that were really just, ref, you know, mirrors of what I was going through and what I was understanding, but I didn't really include my personal story until my third book, Lighter. So it took a while for me to just like start opening up and start telling people about like, you know, sort of the more memoir aspect of writing. But in the beginning, it was always either poetry or essays, poetry or yeah. essays. And then how did your life and how did you change once you started writing? Because I'm sure as you're writing, you're healing at the same time, right? You're, you're learning at the same time. It, it was interesting because like when I started writing, I never, um, like I kept going back to meditation retreats. So like I think probably during, probably in 2014, 2015, like each one of those years, I would do like at least three or four 10 day courses. So I, I would, I would kept going back because I was getting so much. And to me, the, the deep healing was happening in these courses. And eventually I started um, meditating twice a day, every day. And I started that back in 2015. Wow. So like those were my moments where it was like, you know, I'm not on the phone, I'm not on the computer, I'm just sitting down, observing the truth within the framework of the body and trying to, you know, build what was really missing from my life, which was equanimity. And equanimity is like the balance of the mind. All right, let's take a break. Support for today's episode comes from One Skin. If you have sensitive skin, you know how hard it could be to find a product that doesn't cause irritation. But One Skin makes it easy. Their topical supplements are formulated with soothing ingredients and natural antioxidants. Plus, they're gentle enough to use every day, even if you have sensitive skin. One Skin products are powered by the revolutionary OS1 peptide, which is scientifically proven to target aged cells that cause lines, wrinkles, and thinning skin and reverse the biological age of skin by several years. I love using their face and eye cream knowing that I'm helping my skin become more resilient to aging. 
One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using the code TLL at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with the code TLL. After you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. So is that still your process? I'm curious where you get your inspiration for what you write and what that process is. Is it like meditation and then you get some inspiration and you write it? You know, it's interesting because like the the meditating, the it's I had this the interesting relationship where where like meditating made writing possible, but I don't meditate to write. You know, like I meditate to heal my mind, to free my mind, to be able to see more perspectives than my own, to be more peaceful and less reactive. But one of the offshoots of that, one of like the sort of externalities of that is that um is that it does open up more creativity mm-hmm. in the mind. And normally um when I meditate, I'm not trying to like make new poems in my mind or anything like that. I'm just trying to meditate. But usually the inspiration comes from daily life. You know, when I see myself make a mistake or when I see the way my mind tries to create stories that are not necessarily true or the way my mind tries to project its tension. And so either it comes from observing myself through the day or from conversations with my wife where, you know, we're because she's a very serious meditator too. So we're both like on this exploratory path together and, um, you know, we'll, we'll like consider different topics. And, and then there are other times where like poems and pieces will just appear. They'll just like, they're like clearly just pop into my mind and I have to change like one word, if at oh, that. Wow. So, is that your favorite t- format then, poetry, or is it, it? I know when you're sharing writing on social media or just sharing any content, usually people gravitate towards like a style, and so obviously you cre- keep making that style. But I want to know: is that genuinely what you love, or is it just because it was what was popular and trending? I think a lot of people have called me a poet, but I don't really think of myself as a poet because it feels it feels too like it, it's, it's too boxed in. You know, like I, I'm not like a trained classical poet. If anything, you could fit me into the category of popular yeah. poetry, which is like what Langliave has kind of named this whole like wave that's come from the past mm-hmm. 10 years. But I think of myself as a writer because like, yeah, sometimes I love writing poems, but a lot of times, like especially lately, I've been really enjoying just writing essays and writing nonfiction, but it, it took me writing smaller pieces to get comfortable and develop my voice as a writer for me to like, you know, grow into writing longer pieces. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're not in any box. It's writing, writing is just whatever comes out. Yeah, exactly. And I care, I care more, much more about the message than like the style, you know, like that to me. Yeah. Yeah. You're not like, it's not about the structure or this has to rhyme or this has to match. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see that. You started Young Pueblo and things started picking up. I'm curious, what was your vision for yourself as you pursued this path? Like, did you have any idea what it could become? And what was your original dream? Oh, but I love that question. My original dream was to, you know, I had this conversation with my wife where I asked her to give me some time because I wanted to be able to just focus on cultivating my ability to write and then eventually put a book together. And my original dream was hopefully, you know, write a book and then it sell well enough that I can make a living from it. And I wasn't really expecting the book to be like, you know, I hoped, yeah, you know, I, I think every writer hopes that their book is like, you know, a hit that's that serves a lot of people well. But the the original kind of dream was like, you know, maybe I could write a book that does well enough that, you know, I could make... I don't know. I don't know. It was like, I think I had the the number like 100,000 in my mind, right? Like maybe I could sell 100,000 copies or make $100,000 or something like that. And it was a big dream, especially in that that time. And when I saw that things were kind of picking up, I think around like 2017, 2018, 2019, like everything started growing really fast. And and then it just like, you know, blew past what my dream was. I remember there was somebody in my life who told me when uh, around that time, he was like, whatever your dreams are, make them bigger because they're, they're too small. I love that. Yeah. Cause even like this, the style of content you were posting on Instagram, it wasn't like you were making money from it. It was just like becoming really popular. It's, it's not like you're putting ads in your writing or anything. 
Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I intentionally stayed away from ads because I wanted to gain my audience's trust and just like, you know, I'm just trying to put something out there for you. And then I was like, okay, if anything, I can just promote my yeah. own books once they yeah. come out. But, um, but that's been like a good, you know, cause like if you have a million followers, you could be making $0, yeah. but if you have a product where it could be a book or a course or whatever it is that people do, then you can sometimes make money. Okay. So let's move into talking about your books. So tell us about the journey through, I mean, I, th- I guess the first book would be really meaningful, right? So let's talk about the journey of the first book and then, and, and then we'll move on to the others. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. The first book was hard. It was so hard. Like I remember I pushed back the deadline like three times and I, 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 there was a point when I thought it was going to be ready in 2016. And I had to, I remember I pushed it back six months, pushed it back another six months. And I was like, it's just not good enough. And I wasn't, you know, I wanted to write the book, the first book myself. Yep. Like I, I didn't want to do it with a publisher. And I also had oh, this idea. Did you idea, self-publish like, that one? The first book? The first one was self-published, but only, but only for six months because then a publisher bought it and picked it up and put it in bookstores. But I really wanted to do it by myself um, because I didn't really like, I don't know, intuitively it was like, you know, just try to do it with yourself and, and try to, you know, have friends and family edit the book so that, you know, there would be as minimal mistakes as possible. But I also had the sense that like back then, like a publisher wouldn't have given me a deal. And I had to kind of just like prove that, you know, I could be able to sell it. And um, the I ended up releasing the book. I think it was September of 2017, the self-published version. And that version ended up selling like maybe like twelve thousand wow. copies in That's six insane. months. That's yeah. insane. time. Yeah. Back then, I was like, <laughs> oh my! I couldn't even believe it, you know, because I was like, and it was such a dream because I also like, you know, going back, like I grew up really poor, so I would. I remember during that time, I would go to sleep and then wake up and I would see like money in the account that that happened like while I was, you know, people buying books while I was asleep. And that just blew my mind. Wow. But I ended up signing a deal with um, Andrews McMeal and they ended up, um, you know, we ended up doing like a, a revised version of the first book and we released it again in 2018 that had a few more poems and a few more essays. And then we um, it was in bookstores everywhere after that. Wow. So you're saying your first book, that was when you started making money for the first time through your writing? Yeah. So it took, it took like three years. Yeah. Just to write the book. Right. But I also, people don't realize that you started writing, what was it? 2014. So it's like, there's a few years where you're doing this and you're being really consistent as an artist before you're like making any income from it. Yeah. And you'll find that with like 99% of other artists, like when people, whenever people ask for my advice, it's like, you don't even need to be the best at whatever it is you do. You just need to be consistent. If you can continue, mm. like, you know, have that determination to keep going, keep going, eventually things will pan out for you. And you see that across podcasting, you see that across writing, like with whatever field it is, you know, you have to really be determined. Yeah, I believe that too. What motivated you to stay consistent in those early years? What motivated me honestly was the audience was like people were really loving and and you know when you write by yourself, you could be writing something but you don't know if it actually makes sense. <laughs> you don't know if like other people will understand yeah. it. So, I'm really grateful that Instagram was there because I could share it and then I could see like, oh, I could have been clear. Oh, you're getting feedback, direct feedback. Yep. Yeah, that constant feedback and seeing what resonates with the audience and what doesn't. And also also checking in with myself, like, even if this doesn't resonate with the audience, do I love it and still feel like it should be out there? And being able to spend time like cultivating that. But during that period of 2015 to 2018, you know, things were slowly growing. And I, you know, I think it got up to like 400 or 500,000 followers or something like that. And I was like, wow, this is really taking off. Okay. So that's a plus of creating and sharing on social media as an artist is you get that instant feedback. But I know from my experience too, on the flip side is like, you can let that influence you a little too much, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it can influence what you choose to share. It could influence your writing. Tell us what that internal processes like for you? Like, do you think about, oh, what are people going to think of this? Or, oh, people don't love this topic or, or people love this topic. So I'm going to write about it. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's an interesting mixture, which I take a lot of influence from 
the music industry where like you'll notice that some people when they release an album they will write like two pop hits and then the rest of the songs are more like for them kind of heart centered and it's mm-hmm. like okay this is what this is my real this is the real me this is what i'm trying to put out there and in a way it's almost like a marketing tactic where it's like at first you can kind of have to try to get people's attention and see if they'll even you know if you can take a second of their attention maybe they'll give you seven more seconds and then they'll take time mm-hmm. to read a longer piece or something like that so I do notice, okay, I can see what's popular because there's always trends in social media in terms of like, you know, there was a time period where self-love was really popular. And then there was a time period where letting go was really popular and boundaries. And, you know, like there's like these these kind of, um, these trends and these topics that become really, you know, if you write about them, then more likely you'll have a hit. Yeah. But if you only focus on that, that I think it, um, it makes your work superficial. Because it takes away from what else you want to say. It's not that you don't, it's, it's not authentic, but it's like only one piece of your story, right? Totally. You become highly limited. And I think you end up finding like, you know, even if you have like 3 million followers, the people who end up buying your books or buying whatever it is that you're creating, they're going to want the depth. They're not just going to want like the, you know, the, the one meme that's a hit or anything like that. So, right, you know, you course. can get people's attention with like a meme hit, but then after that, they're not going to, you know, they're really going to trust you after you give them real depth. Mm, I love that. Another thing I'm curious about is, I mean, I love journaling. So do you journal and do you keep the writing separate? Like, oh, this writing is for them. And then this is for me. <laughs> and what does that look like? Oh, that's a really good question. I have like um, really scattered, like I have a lot of journals that have three pages full and then like they're totally empty. And (laughs) I've tried to journal, but I haven't really ever been able to stick to it because I've just, if I'm going to spend my time writing, then I usually just like open up a Word doc and I'm like, let me see what's coming out. Yeah, because essentially when I read your work, it's like it's a journal excerpt almost. Like it could be, right? Yeah, it definitely could be. Because it's very reflective. Yeah. So it feels like in a way, I'm definitely reflecting just openly. Okay. So you actually share most of the things you write then? A lot of them. A lot of them. I've also lost a lot of poems. Like, yeah. I've said this before. I've, I've done a few writing workshops and it, I think it stresses out my editors and stuff. But sometimes like I'm walking, you know, in the street or I'm, you know, in a cab or I'm in the train or doing something and, and I get a moment of inspiration and I open my phone write a poem in one of my notes in my phone, but then like come a year later when I'm putting a book together, I can, I can't find the poem anymore. So, <laughs> really? Yeah. So some of them totally oh. just get lost in the ether, get lost. In oh the my poem. God, that's hilarious. Yeah. And some good ones too. <laughs> I remember I spent time being like, I know I made this thing, but where is it? And I just like, Wait, you, you write it down in your phone notes? A lot of them. Yeah. And you can't find it? So is it, are your notes just insane? They're just, they're like full of tons and tons of words. Yeah. Wow. So I, I end up sharing maybe <laughs> I end up sharing maybe like probably like forty percent of what I write. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, also on social media, do you like choose what to share or do you basically share everything? Like I understand for a book you want to choose the best, right? But for social media, do you b- share most of what you write or is do you still filter it? You know, I'll share maybe like ten percent of a book. Um, but then I also, one of the things I'm really grateful for, for social media and specifically Instagram is that it gives you the opportunity to give things away for free. And I know that there's people reading from all over the world who just probably don't have the money to buy the book. Mm -hmm. So I totally respect that. And if you want to get a sense of what I'm writing, you could just scroll down the Instagram and get a clear idea of like what the message is. Um, so I'm grateful for that, but You know, I run my own, like the Instagram account, I'm the one posting every day. I'm the one making the memes. I'm the one, you know, like I haven't, um, only when I go away to meditate for long meditation courses, then I'll have my wife's little sister, she'll post for me. Oh, wow. And I'll just like line, I'll line everything out for her for each day or what she should post and all that. But other than that, when I'm here in the world, I'm the one doing it. That's amazing. It's like, you would think that you have like this big team and you're, I don't know, <laughs> but it's, it's nice to hear that. Let's take another break for today's sponsor, Shopify. 
Of all the things I've created, I'm most proud of the Artist of Life workbook and our online shop. For the past five years, we've been proudly hosting our shop on Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business with their all-in-one e-commerce platform. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkouts, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. Through Shopify, we've been able to reach customers from all over the world. Their interface is easy to use and they organize the data you need to understand and grow your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US and powers millions of businesses of every size across 160 75 countries. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash TLL, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash TLL now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash TLL. Okay. So back to the journey through your books. So we talked about the first one. Was the first one is inward, yes? Yes, that, that's right. And then next, clarity and connection. So let's talk about what each book meant to you, because it must have like either reflected a different part of your journey, or it must have ref- like you know a different message that you wanted to share. So l- let's go through each. Yeah. So clarity and connection. I ended up writing that book. I finished it during the worst parts of the pandemic, and I finished it like. It was it was a funny thing because I am writing the book and I had already started writing more about relationships because if you notice the first book is more so just about personal growth and then I started realizing like in my life as I'm working on healing myself um my friendships and my relationship with my wife relationship with my parents all these relationships are improving so I started learning from that and I started just, you know, writing down what I was understanding. And when we had like lockdown and all that stuff, my wife and I, so she, 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 um, worked as a scientist and during lockdown, you know, we were both again in our apartment in New York city and, um, we started enjoying the time that we were spending together, but there were a lot of things that were sort of like quietly unresolved about our relationship that we didn't have time to like, you know, talk about and figure out and process because both of us were so busy. And now that we had time, I was like, oh, I was like, we have some kinks to figure out in our relationship. And um, I think a lot of the poems about the connection aspect of clarity and connection came from that time period. So Mm. even when the manuscript was due, I remember like pushing my editor and being like, okay, put this, put this poem in there, like just shove it in there somewhere. Because I was like still making things about relationships. Okay, so that theme was relationships and during the pandemic. And then what about lighter? So lighter was... What was that journey? Yeah, that journey was... Uh, and, and do you take a break between books or do you, are you just jumping into the next book after you turn in the previous one? Usually when I'm releasing a book, I'm already writing another one. Um, so like I'm, I'm, I just released The Way Forward, but I'm writing my next book right now. Yeah. So lighter, it was interesting because that was like the big challenge because that was the big shift away from the poetry and prose format into nonfiction. And not, and lighter was a much bigger book. And not only did I have to write in a slightly different way, but I had to talk about myself. Like I had to, you know, talk about my story. So I remember I first sent in the manuscript to my editor and he was like, we need to know more about you. He was like, we, you're, you're not in this book. You know, like you, you have like, people want to know where is this all coming from? So like, what's the backstory? And then I had to like really just challenge myself and just be much more open about my story. Um, and I think that was good. I think that was actually really therapeutic to be, you know, like, this is what happened to me. This is who I was before. And, and, you know, now I'm a very different version of myself now, but I really think of lighter as like, I think it was a big healing process for me to even be able to put that book together. And and it was fun. It was fun being able to do something that was totally different from before. Yeah. And in being more vulnerable, were there any surprises in how people received it? Or I, I guess any surprises in that journey? I was just, I was happy that the audience was cool with it because, you know, I was doing something really different from... Because you're like judging yourself as you're writing it. I'm sure it's like hard. Yeah. And I'm also curious about how, how they're going to take it. Because like, not only is it like an inner battle for me, but I'm like, you know, people expect short pieces and short essays, but now I'm trying to give them like chapters. And, um, 
but they dug it. Like people, people were really down. And, you know, there were some people who told me like they read it like five, wow. 10 times. And I'm, I'm, you know, every, every time I write a book, the whole point of it is to hopefully this is something that's useful and that is of service. So it was nice to hear that people really connected with it. And then tell us about your new book. I know you're already working on the next one, but what, what is the way forward? Why did you write it? And what phase of life were you in writing this one? Yeah, the way forward was cool. That that the way forward is a much more mature book. Like, I felt like it. To, it wasn't until I wrote Clarity and Connection that I felt like my voice as a writer had become a little more mature. And even with Inward, it was very still fresh. You know, like and even though like it took from when I started writing to when I released the official version of that book that's available now, that's like a four year period. But it wasn't until Clarity and Connection that came out two years after that, that I was like, okay, now I'm really here. Like, I'm really like, I really have a much more confidence in what I'm writing. And um, so I felt like Inward and Clarity and Connection, they weren't complete. Like they, to me, they needed to be a trilogy. Oh, so the way forward is the end of that trilogy that closes off, you know, this, this sort of like short poetry and prose format. And the way forward is all about how the world is like constantly changing, right? It's con- so how do you navigate an ever changing world? And to me, that answer is you have to figure out what matters to you in terms of your values, and you have to trust your intuition. And that's the that's going to be your compass. That's going to move, help you move mm, forward. I love that. So, what were the biggest lessons that you learned writing that book, The Way Forward? That one, I learned to. I learned to relax while producing a book, which was very different from the other ones where like I was writing later and I was like up until like two, three in the morning, like, you know, going through all these edits, writing new stuff. And, and I would just be like, it was like almost like I would disappear from life for like a few weeks at a time. Cause you know, you send chunks to your editor and you have this like real back and forth process. But whenever he threw the ball to me and it was my turn, I was like, okay, and I would just like be kind of like hunched over my laptop, writing, writing, writing. And, but the way forward, I felt like, I'm like, okay, let me do this in a much more peaceful process. Like, I don't want to just, I don't know. I'm always really mindful of the energy that I'm putting into the things yeah. that I'm creating, <laughs> even with the Instagram account, you know? So when I post something online, I don't want to be agitated. I want to make sure to be calm. And um, so I was trying to put that same calm energy into the way forward. Yeah, no, I totally resonate with that. Like do not stressing out and being all anxious, but just doing things in a peaceful way. And it it's funny because what you write is about like it's it is very calm. It's about healing and it's it's funny imagining you being like stressed <laughs> writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. stress, yeah. <laughs> and then for the creatives, you know, I I'm sure they're curious about your creative process in, in just writing a book? Like, do you show up every morning to write? Like, what is, how do you make sure that you're writing consistently? And do you have like a routine or a ritual? Yeah, thank you. That's a nice question. I think um, what I found is that, so through all the meditating, I've become much more aware of that feeling of creativity when it arises. So when I feel creativity come up, I jump on it. I'm just like, this is the time to write a bunch of stuff. And I'll produce like a bunch of little pieces. I'll produce some essays. And, you know, it might be that flow of creativity might come for like four days in a row. And I'll just like make a bunch of stuff. And then it may like, you know, it was interesting. So last week I actually ended up writing a bunch of stuff. This week I haven't really Mm -hmm. written anything. So what I have to make sure of is that I don't let that time period where I don't write anything, I don't let it really go for two weeks, Yeah. right? Like I I have to, at some point, I just put my foot down, whether it's bad or good, I make myself write because it also feels like a muscle and it needs to keep that training going to be able to flow. So my writing style isn't like, you know, five pages every day. That to me feels too forced. More so it's like riding the waves of creativity as they come and go. Okay. I love that. As a creative, I also agree. You have, when you feel the inspiration, you have to act on it. If you, cause usually I like in the past, I, I will like write a note. Oh, I'll come back to this later. And when you come back to it, you just, it's like, where's, I don't feel like writing about this anymore. <laughs> like, yep. It doesn't have the, it doesn't have the same sauce. It doesn't have that same energy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you just, you allow yourself to flow with that, but 
you don't let yourself not write for too long. Like it's a balance between flow and consistency. Yeah. And if I find that, you know, I'm not, you know, the four days of not writing, then I'm just like, like, you know, I've spent this whole week reading a lot. Like, you know, as opposed to like, you know, I'm always, I always have like meetings and things that I'm working on. So I'll do my meetings and whatnot, but, but I'll make sure to spend a lot of time reading when I'm not writing. Cause then it just like, you know, it keeps, it keeps that, keep feeding that creative outlet. Do you batch like specific writing days? Cause you said you have like, I'm sure you have life and meetings and all this other admin stuff to deal with. So what is that like? I end up doing a lot of writing on like Thursdays and Fridays. So like, like I know tomorrow I'm going to wake up and just like, I'm going to write something for my sub stack. Um, and I'm excited because I don't, I have no idea what I'm going to write. So I love those moments when like, I don't know uh-huh. what I'm going to write and I'm just going to sit in front of the laptop and just Figure like see what comes yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. And just like, and it's nice. I think those are some of the nicest moments. Cause like, it's just like whatever kind of intuitively wants to come out. So I end up batching the week. Like I have, you know, a lot of, cause I, I, um, I'm also part of, I'm a co-founder of a venture capital company and, uh, called Wisdom Ventures. So Tuesdays are, you know, they're, they're called venture capital Tuesdays is like what I call them. And I just have like mad wow. meetings for those days. And for Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm also building, um, my own startup that's relationship focused. Okay. Can you tell us any more about that? Yeah, sure. So it's called Ready. And um, you, Ready is basically a, an evolved dating app. It's for people who want a serious relationship, but it's also for, for people who really care about their personal growth. So we've, I don't know, we've come to learn, especially people who are like in the wellness field and whatnot, that if you're able to develop your self-awareness, you're going to develop a deeper connection with yourself and with your partner. So that feels like it's something that's not really included in other dating yeah. apps. So I want to bring, you know, people who want something serious and who also care about yeah. their growth and want a partner who cares about their growth together. Yeah. But we don't want to stop there. We also want to support the relationship because it's not the type of thing where like, okay, you might have a connection, but there are so many ups and downs in the process of getting to know each other. And even when you're an official couple or anything like that, there's so much more to learn about like what are good ways to argue what are good ways to you know to improve your communication mm, i see there's some personal growth tips on the platform yeah totally no i like that it is i definitely see a need cuz it it is true like when you're on this journey you obviously want to meet someone who's also on the same journey yeah i'm excited and we've already we opened up a wait list so if anybody listening wants to join they can go to Ready, readyplatform.co and they can sign up to the waitlist. Yeah. So with Wisdom Ventures and with this new startup, are you the one that, like, I guess, how do you get involved in these new projects? Are you initiating or do you just have like a lot of things that you want to do <laughs> <laughs> outside of writing? Yeah. Outside of writing, I, you know, during, when I was actually writing Clarity and Connection and finishing it, I remember during that time, I felt like, I was like, something's missing. Like there's a whole part of my brain that I'm not really using. Oh. And I knew something was coming. And then I think a few, like maybe like four or five months after the book was done and maybe it wasn't released yet, but it was complete. Um, a friend of mine from from the West Coast, from Silicon Valley, he like um, told me about his idea to start Wisdom Ventures. And when, when I heard about it, I was like, man, I want to help. Mm. I want to be a part of it. And, you know, I was one of the the six co-founders and I'm just, I'm lucky that, you know, I ended up meeting him from this conference called Wisdom 2.0 that mm-hmm. he runs. His name's Soren mm-hmm. Gordhammer and fantastic human being, but it's been really fun, you know, just being able to, because the whole point of Wisdom Ventures is to invest in companies that are going to try, going to serve people well, companies that are trying to design their products in a compassionate manner and that are keeping the well-being of the user in mind. So like, you know, if it's a new app or a new platform and they're taking in all your data and they have your attention, we want to make sure that they're not trying to make you more addictive and they're not trying to hurt you in any way because we've seen the harm that's done. Right, right. So it's like businesses that have like a conscious aspect to it. Yeah, they just, they want to help people and they don't want to hurt them. Nice. And then the for Ready, were you the one that started that? Yeah, that one came to me when I remember... I got an email 
from, I think it was from these, from this person from Singapore. And they told me that they went out to a party and at the party, they found someone else who followed my work and they like the two of them really hit it off. (laughs) You were their dating app. (laughs) I know. And that was like the first thing that kind of started, you know, turning the wheels. And then I had conversations with my friends and was hearing about their experiences on dating apps. And like, they either had terrible experiences or they had some like semi-traumatizing experiences. So to me, it's like, okay, well, there's a bunch of, you know, these, these first generation, second generation dating apps, but we need to try to make something better, something that allows for authenticity to flow forward. And that brings in this idea of, you know, of reflection that you can actually grow because everybody wants someone who does the work, but there's no like visualization of how to do the work. So that's what Ready is trying to provide is like, not only can you see someone's picture, but you can also see how much time someone is spending reflecting on themselves and growing. Oh, really? How how do you show that on your profile on the app? Well, you're going to be able to, so on the app, before you can even see people that you can start chatting with, you have to answer a daily reflection question. Oh. So first you have to reflect and then you can, you know, get the opportunity to, you know, see if there's a spark with somebody. Are you saying like they they get to read your daily reflection answers sort of thing? Or what do you mean? You can make some of them public if you want. It's like almost like your private journal. Like you can have, you know, you'll you'll be like reflecting on yourself over a long period of time, but people will be able to see that you you have a streak, you know, you've been reflecting for X number of days. Oh, that's so interesting. I, I'm so curious to see how this will turn out. I'll, I'll, I'll stay updated with it. Yeah, cool. Okay, because you write about living with inner peace and you even said now you're approaching life with more, more peace and less stress. So what advice can you share with others on how to live, you know, with more inner peace? I think the, the main thing is you have to find your tool. Like that that's probably the most important thing is like, don't, don't necessarily, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, but like, you know, for some people, it's like a very consistent practice of yoga is helping them cultivate and heal themselves. You know, you just mentioned how much you love journaling. Like that's clear self-reflection. Yeah. Other people, like I really love to meditate. That's, that's my thing. Some people like therapy. Some people need psychiatry. Like it just depends on your own mind. So like what works for me may not necessarily work for you, but we live in a time in history where there's tons of stuff out there. There's so many things that you can do to cultivate yourself. So if you want to live a more peaceful life, you need to find your tool. You need to find the thing that works for you that's challenging but not overwhelming, and then you'll see some growth. Yeah, that's good advice because no one is the same. So you have to find what works for you. Totally, totally. And then since you're such a big meditator, um, can you tell us how you meditate and then give some tips as well? The meditation technique that I do, this Vipassana technique, it's like to give the meditation instructions, like that's why you go away to a 10-day course because at the 10-day course, you learn step by step. You know, it's like one giant lead meditation course. So if you're interested in that style of meditating, you can check dhamma.org, dhamma.org, and then you can see if that's something you want to try. It's very difficult. Mm. It's not like hard, like, the meditation instructions themselves are, you know, very, they're very simple, but they're very hard to do. And, but the process of going to a 10 day course, you know, it's meant to help you clear the subconscious of your mind. But in the process of clearing the subconscious of your mind, like there's going to be some gnarly stuff in there, right? Like all this, like old trauma, old hurt, like all this old anger, whatever, whatever heavy emotions you've been accumulating throughout your lifetime, they're going to be there. And I think for anybody that does, is interested in meditating, like there are, uh, there's so many different types of meditating that what you want to do is sort of allow yourself to be steeped in a style of meditating so that you can really understand how it functions because different meditation traditions, they're going to have different goals and different ways that they go about it and different ways that they deal with, you know, emotions and whatever it is that comes up. So general advice for meditating is like, you know, find a technique, learn it well, and learn it from someone who's been meditating for many, many thousands of hours, not just somebody who like took, you know, who just like learned how to meditate over the weekend. Right. So each time you do the, these like 10 day or retreats, it's the same type of meditation. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing the same style of meditation. Uh, so you've gone deep with this one style. 
yeah, I picked this this one style as because when I came out, I I knew that like my mind genuinely felt lighter. Like that's where I got the title from for of lighter because like I, I was like I'm not enlightened, but my mind is lighter. Wow. And then I thought to myself, well, I could go explore other things, but why? You know, like this thing is giving me it works so well. And one of my friends had this beautiful saying. He was like, if I have fresh water here. Why am I going to go over there for fresh water? Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. to me, it's like, let me try to master this technique as much as I can in this one lifetime and do my best with making progress. And even, you know, I just finished a, a silent 45 day retreat in that same- 45? <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. Wow. Yeah, it was a long one, but in that same style. And when I came out, like I've ne- my mind has never, ever been that peaceful, like ever, ever, ever in my life. And I could feel it. And my, even my wife, she sat the course too. And she was like, wow, you're different. And to me, it's like, um, if I'm getting so much from this technique, you know, why would I go somewhere else? Yeah, that makes sense. Wow. Um, so if, with this style of meditation, you said meditate, different types have different goals. What's the goal of this, this style? And how long in one period are you meditating for? In the course, in the sorry, in the meditation retreats, you're meditating like, you know, you have you'll meditate for like an hour and then take like a five minute break, and then come back and you'll 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 do as much as you can do, but you have the opportunity to meditate up to eleven hours a day. <laughs> wow. Okay. And you know during so like when I was at the forty five day retreat, I was meditating eleven hours a day, and um, and it's you know it's a type of practice where like the goal is purification. Like the goal is the end of suffering. You know, like it's, it's a meditation that originates from the Buddhist teaching. And the goal is really just to, to cut at the root of what's creating misery. And that root is craving. The root is aversion, aversion, ignorance. So you spend your time cultivating wisdom by being able to observe the truth within the framework of the body. And when you're able to observe that truth, it helps just clean out the mind. And you'll feel, you know, the memories of what happened in the past, they won't go away, but the intensity of the reaction, that does decrease over yeah. time. Wow. So you, when you're in a deep session like that, what are you experiencing? The, the, clearest, the clearest thing that you're experiencing is the truth of impermanence, is like the truth of change. Like you're clearly understanding this like fundamental law that is pervasive throughout the universe. And luckily you have a sample of the universe within your body, right? Within your body, you have like whatever, you know, everything else that's out there in the universe, it's inside of you. Um, And that truth of impermanence is like, it's a real like life changer because a lot of the difficulties that we have is because we're rejecting change. Like we're fighting change. We don't like change. We want whatever it is that we find enjoyable to stay the same all the time. And that's not realistic. Like life is constantly ebbing and flowing and changing. So if we're able to embrace change, and luckily we can experience that change within the framework of the body so we get more used to it, then when you're out there living life, it becomes a lot easier when there's a change that you like or there's a change that you don't like. So you get less attached to either one. Right. I mean, how have you changed as a person then? I would, let's say in the past couple of years, and then also going deep into meditation, like how are you changed now? When I think of my past self, I was a lot rougher and not like necessarily mean or, you know, I was just like, I was rough, like rough in my interactions. And now from all this meditating, I feel like it's my job to just move through the world gently, you know, to just, and gentleness has been like my mission, <laughs> like, you know, just be gentle with the people that you're interacting with do your best to like bring harmony to a situation if you can. And um, that change I think has been like, it's been really nice because if you're, you know, actively trying to support harmony, then that's going to also support the harmony in your mind. So much of what you're saying is resonating with me. I literally came out with a video today called like the gentle pursuit of inner joy and fulfillment. Cause oh, I'm cool. also, I'm also leaning towards like a more gentle life where you're just flowing intuitively like nature and you embrace the change, you embrace the seasons. Like, like you don't need to do anything beyond that. There's no need to force or to try or, you know what I mean? Like I, yeah, and no, I think I more people are coming to the gentle, more of the gentle perspective of life. Versus like the super masculine hustle, right? Totally, totally. And it's fine to be like, 
ambitious and have goals, but you don't need to like be mad stressed out to accomplish them. Exactly. Yeah. Like you're still doing a lot of amazing things, like your writing and your businesses. Like people would think that you're in go, go, go mode. <laughs> yeah. But to hear that you're still able to have a level of peace and balance while doing these things, I think is really encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It feels like to me, like first and foremost, I'm a meditator and then everything else is second, you know? So like I, so I, I put the time and like I meditate two hours a day, every day, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening. And that's my time where I get to like, you know, reconnect with that truth of impermanence, like regenerate and really just like not allow delusion to take place. Cause like a lot of our stress comes from delusion. Like we get so agitated by these stories in the mind and we forget that, you know, we're creating a lot of misery for ourselves. Yeah. So Diego, at the end of your life, what do you want to be remembered for? Oh, hopefully that I was, that I was a good server um, you know, like I think of, I like the term, the term service because that feels really important. It just feels really important to serve people well, whether it's, you know, in the product that you're creating or the art that you make or the, you know, podcast you might be doing, or even in your, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, like that you're actively trying to serve people well. And I think, um, you know, hopefully people are like, he served really well. He's a good server. Nice. <laughs> I just realized we didn't talk about your next book. So <laughs> can you give us anything about what the next book would be about? Uh, sure. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm halfway through the book right now and um, I'm excited to write the other half, but the next one is like just about love. It's about love and relationships. Oh. And I had a chapter, you know, like I wrote, I've written poems about it. I had a chapter about love in lighter, but I realized like, that I need, I can dedicate a whole book to it. And, um, it's such a big topic that you can take it in so many different directions, but I wanted to be really focused in on how your personal growth really elevates your ability to love. Yeah. Like the more you can love yourself, the more you can love others. And the more you're aware of, <laughs> the more you can be understanding and compassionate. Totally. And it gives you a lot of patience. Yeah. And I, I'm curious, like, so you mentioned you and your wife are on the same path. Yep. So how does her being in your life influence your work? Huge. She's a huge influence. She's she's always the And is she a behind the scenes person cuz is she public in any way? No, no, she's totally private. She doesn't she doesn't want she doesn't want any attention. Not on social media at all. Not on she has she has her private account that like, you know, 300 people follow her. And um but she's my manager and she's also my primary, like my first editor. Oh, okay. She reads everything. You're right. She reads everything and she's like, this is not good. This doesn't make sense. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and just like gives it to me a hundred percent truthful. Um, yeah. But she's like, she's made everything possible. Like she's the center of my life. You know, she's like, mm. she's an incredible human. Was she there with you for most of the journey? Oh, the whole thing, the whole thing. Oh, the whole thing yeah. from the beginning. We've been, oh, we've been together incredible. for, a, we've been together. We got together when she was 18 and I was 19. So we had this very kind of chaotic first half of our relationship just because like we were both really immature. There was no like emotional maturity between either of us. You grew together. You evolved together. Yeah, we we definitely grew together. And um and now we have, you know, we still have our like our ups and downs, but we're there's a deep deep love that binds us together. So but through that, like I I trust her the most and I really trust her intuition, so that's why she's my manager because whenever we're you know, making any deals with people or new publishers or new editors and whatnot. I also like, you know, she needs to say, okay, too, because if like someone doesn't feel quite right, then, then it's a no. You tell her, I think she deserves more credit. <laughs> 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 She's part of Young Pueblo, this, this career and this business, this journey. Yeah. I mean, she's definitely part of it. And she's like, she's amazing. She's a fantastic person, but um, I, I admire the way she just like, is able to, you know, she's, she's helped build this whole thing too. Yeah. But I'm, I'm also yeah. trying my best to respect what she wants. I mean, the other day there was, we got this offer to, um, 
that somebody really wanted the both of us to speak about our relationship and they wanted to pay us a bunch of money. And she was like, heck no. She was like, I'm not, <laughs> you know, like, I'm not trying to yeah, do that. Yeah, because if you're writing about relationships and love, it kind of seems natural to like bring her into it, but she's <laughs> not down. Yeah, she's she's not interested. Yeah. So I just respect her wishes and yeah, it's fine by me. Yeah. It's just interesting to hear. Again, I can relate to your life because I've also been with the same person. Mm -hmm. We're not married yet, boyfriend since I was 17, but he's literally been with me this whole journey. Cool. Like, you know, I, you were very immature when you started dating and you literally became different people in different stages of your life. It's kind of crazy. It really is. And it feels like, it almost feels like a different life. Like when I look back on how I was before, it just feels totally foreign. Mm-hmm. It's just like... Like, who was I? <laughs> yeah, like that was me. But I'm really glad that I made the decisions to get me to where I am now because I'm, yeah, just totally different than before. Yeah. And I think it's a beautiful thing when you can continue growing together at like and staying together because sometimes people, it doesn't always match up. But the fact that you were both on this journey and you're still here is amazing. I know. And I think it's because we were both... I think that's part of the reason, like there was something special about us coming together. I think, um, you know, not only do we have a deep connection, but once we started meditating, that was when we were both like, oh, now I see why we're Mm -hmm. together. Like we both really love this thing, but it just took us a while to get to it. And um, she feels like, you know, she's my wife, but she's also my comrade in wisdom. Amazing. All right, Diego, do you have any final messages that you want to leave the listeners with today? It could be on any topic that we cover today. I think one thing that is really helpful is I love the way people have gratitude practices like during the day. And it's really valuable because it's so easy to just forget that you have running water and food and, you know, like air to breathe and these sort of beautiful, majestic basics of life. But the same way that we should have these daily moments of gratitude, I also think it's important to, even at the intellectual level, um, to just remember that everything's always changing, right? Every, everything is changing and you don't know when the big changes will come. So if there are people with you, that you love, appreciate them, like be present with them, pay attention to them when they're speaking and you know, value that these opportunities that you have because you don't know when they're going to end, when they're going to go away. And similarly, when bad things are happening, like they're also temporary. So just, just allow change to keep flowing. I think the more you embrace change, the more you, it helps you appreciate the present moment. Yes. A thousand percent. Beautiful. Okay. Where can we find you online? You can find me on Instagram at uh, yung underscore P-U-E-B-L-O, Young Pueblo, and also on Substack, uh, youngpueblo.substack.com. And um, and my books are in bookstores everywhere. Amazing. Thank you so much. I genuinely enjoyed our conversation today and you are such a light. Thank you for what you do. Yeah, thank you so much too. I love the conversation as well. 